I think there's a, a recent uh, phenomenon amongst probably millennials and the younger generation um, that when it comes to describing things, they don't seem to maybe have the same range of vocabulary as people used to. So if you hear younger people talking about things, they often say like, so I was like, whoa, and she was like, yeah, and I was like, whoa, crazy, and he was like, whoa, and what are you saying? It's like a serious lack of adjectives here. I mean, I, but they understand each other, right? And I was like, lol. <laughs> It's not even a word. Lol isn't, it's not a word. Maybe it's a word now, but it wasn't a word now. Anyway, point being, but they understand each other and they're able to communicate, right, using this foreign tongue. And, 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 and I'll say they understand, they, they, they get what they're talking about and what, what's mainly communicated or what's maybe the most effective uh, aspect of their communication, right, is their enthusiasm, right, their passion. So it's because what they're saying, they're saying passionately, you get the point, even though the words make no sense, or they mightn't even be using words, right? So, but you, you get what they're saying because they have passion, right? So I think passion, when, when, when one speaks, it's so important that we speak passionately, and also about the faith. It is so important that we speak passionately about our faith. I remember, like, you, you'll, all have, you'll all have friends who are passionate about golf, or passionate about a certain soccer team, or passionate about a certain brand of car, whatever it was. And because they speak so passionately, like you, you, you see how you feel in yourself, how you, mm, hey, maybe I will buy a Toyota so if they're that good, or well, maybe I will go to Mallorca if you went there and it was so amazing, or yeah, well, I suppose maybe I could get a good old Stanley oven since you're raving about it constantly, you know. So we, we hear about these things, and then their, their passion is kind of somehow infectious. And even if they weren't the most eloquent, even if Granny was like, I bought a stove, and it was like, whoa. <laughs> you know, even if she, even, even if she complete, was completely inept in describing it, her enthusiasm, right, is kind of infectious. I'd go, well, maybe, maybe I will get a Stanley stove. So, point being, uh, when it comes to, to witnessing to our faith, right, passion is so important. And the Lord, the, Jesus himself, spoke with great passion. The, the, the opposite to that is... To speak about our faith with a certain amount of, I, 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 I don't know, I think it's something that we, we probably have been exposed to for, for, for maybe quite some time, maybe a number of decades, but this kind of, ah, sure, it'll be grand kind of attitude, you know, so, so rather than, than, than hearing uh, talks, homilies, whatever it may be, uh, or being educated in school about like, you know, the importance of our faith and how important it is to pray. And we must pray every day because every day is a battle. But every day the Lord wants to give us his daily bread. Every day, every day the Lord wants to, wants to strengthen us. Every day the Lord wants to carry us. And each day as he carries us, the ultimate goal of being carried is heaven. And you hear about that, you go, yes. Whereas if someone says, ah, sure, you know, the bit of prayer. Ah, sure, the little bit of prayer every now and again. And do the bit in you can. And sure, sure, we'll, we'll plod along. And sure, it'll all be grand. My goodness, like that's, it's, it's the absolute, it's, it's so, it's the perfect way of emptying churches of all men. Because <laughs> it's just, there's nothing that actually needs done. We like doing stuff. We're kind of active, right? But there's, not, there's nothing actually to be done. Because there's uh, the bit in a prayer. Sure, I pray, I go, I pray once a year. And um, I say, God help us a lot. So there you are, I'm done. <laughs> like, and that's it. Like, there's, actually, there's nothing to be achieved, so... Why would I put in any effort? It's, it's, it's all good, like, it's all done, okay? So the, the, the importance of passion, and I would couple that with, with a certain amount of urgency, right? Urgency. That, again, when we're talking about faith, and the, the Lord, Jesus, I mean, look at what Jesus, how Jesus preaches, what Jesus says, you know? There's always a sense of urgency. The time is now. God's kingdom is here in your midst, you know, repent and believe in the good news, says, says, says uh, John the Baptist. You know, now, now. Ah, sure, look at it, Lord, because we'll say the, the, the bit in a prayer, and sure, we'll have the old novena now in, in two months' time, and sure, Lord, be, and there's, there's no kind of sense that, that now my life needs to be kind of <laughs> focused or refocused on, on the greatest things, on God, on heaven, on eternal salvation, on virtue. Now, not, not when I'm 80, not when I'm retired, not when the kids have moved out, not when, now, right now, right now. 
And so then, like, if you, if you couple these things, you know, if you, if you couple this, this kind of passion and urgency, even though a lot of us might find ourselves a bit short of the mark when it comes to explaining our faith or, or witnessing to our faith, and we'd love to be more, we'd love to be smarter, we'd love to be more educated, we'd love to have the catechism there, like, just like a Google reference in your head that you can just, you know, rattle it off or to, to know scripture uh, front to back, you know, in the original Greek or Hebrew, uh, and, and you'd, love, you'd love to have all that, but that's, that's not actually what's going to make you a good witness, a good disciple of the Lord. I think your passion is much more important than we believe. That we, we, we say what we believe with conviction, passion, and urgency. Now, obviously, we maybe be a bit better add with, compa- with passion, compassion, just so we don't, you know, beat the message uh, into the people we love. Uh, passion, compassion, and urgency. So when we read today's gospel, it, it's, I remember hearing a talk years ago, and the priest highlighted this word which seems completely insignificant, right? So it, 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 it starts off, the Son of Man must be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Now the next word, again, it just seems completely irrelevant or out of place. Yes! For God so loved the world. What's that yes doing there? Like no one asked the question. No one said no. There's no kind of, it's just, it's just actually, it's the Lord's passion in the sense of enthusiasm, you know. Uh, the, 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 Lord, the Lord just kind of giving it, giving it loads. And he says, yes, for God loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost but may have eternal life. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. You know, you just learn that, learn those lines off. There's your homework for today. Like, learn those lines off. It's John 3.16, the the sign that you see at the back of uh, the goals often in in Croke Park and major sporting events around here. John 3.16, that's it, right? Yes, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that whoever believes in him might not perish, might not be lost, but might have eternal life. Can you say those lines with passion? I mean, and it's even like that's why it's 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 a good experience every now and again to, to pray with a bit of passion, you know, and, and, and not to to get into this kind of rut of oh, Janie, I have to pray again, and you kind of drag yourself through it. Like, but at the times when you see people who pray and they they pray with with enthusiasm, with passion, with love, and when they sing or when they answer the mass, they do so with with real conviction. You know, it's good for us. It's good for us to see. Wow, I, I shouldn't get used to praying. I shouldn't get familiar with praying. Prayer should be my response to the Lord's passionate love for me. The Lord makes an interesting observation <clears throat> towards the end of our gospel, where he says, Everyone who does wrong hates the light and avoids it for fear that his actions should be exposed. When you think, I remember, uh, I might have shared this with you before, but <clears throat> there was a particular um, club, dance club, nightclub type thing. Um, if anyone is watching this who isn't from Ireland, nightclub doesn't mean what it means in America. It means a disco. Just It's not, it's not the other thing. Uh, so, uh, and it was particularly seedy, right? It was just, you'd walk in there and there was an absolute blast of a smell of hash. And it was, it was, it was much darker than, than most clubs. And yeah, just big thumping dance beats. That's why I went there, because I liked the music. But the atmosphere there, the atmosphere there was just really sinister. There was something, I don't know, just this kind of sixth sense or spiritual sense was just going off, there's something wrong here, you know, something. But it was dark. It was much, as I say, much darker than, 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 than most clubs. And that's kind of the way a lot of Saturday night activity is built up. Clubs and pubs and places, they're, 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 they're that bit darker, right? Especially nightclubs, you know? Because you go in there, then it's, it's kind of, it's, it's more private or, there's, you know, there are dark corners to the place. It's... It all gets a bit, a bit seedy and sinister. Why? So that your actions are hidden. Your actions are hidden. Your actions can't be seen. I've used this analogy before, but 
<clears throat> if we turn off all the lights here, or as I used to experience myself, I mean, if you're ever doing the wash up, if you're ever washing plates or doing the wash up, washing anything, turn the lights off, right? I find that the wash up goes much quicker. And why would that be, Father? <laughs> Right? The wash-up goes really quickly in the dark because you can't see the dirt. Right? Or if, you, if, you're, <clears throat> if all the lights are off, you can look down and say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm spotless here. I'm spotless. It's all good. Someone turns on the light and you go, whoa, where did that gravy come from? Like, I was like, whoa, it's like crazy. <laughs> right? like, so only in the light you begin to see the stains. Now, you have two options here, right? Either you fix the stain, so you clean it, or you blame the light. You can blame the light, right? It was you, your fault, you turned on the light. When I was in the dark, I was absolutely fine. Then you come along with your finger button thing, turn on the light, then now look, this, now look at what you've caused. You make me feel bad. And because you make me feel bad, you're wrong. Welcome to the modern world. You know, you, you, you bring in the light. We bring in the teaching of the Lord. It might, yes, make, me, make people feel bad. And because they feel bad, we're wrong. Now, anyone explain that logic to me? Because that, that, just, that justifies reason. That makes no sense at all. Are we looking for truth or not? Now, that's a whole other discussion that um, many philosophers or commentators say that this is a, a post truth society where in today's world we're not actually looking for the truth anymore because if the truth makes me feel bad then it's it's not truth it's not, then your truth is your truth and my truth is my truth and the actual objective truth doesn't matter it's not it's not important because if what's important are, are my feelings and if something makes me feel good it's good if something makes me feel bad it's bad so if something you teach makes me feel bad you're wrong regardless of the object, regardless of science, makes no difference. That's why even like the pro-life arguments now, which are all scientifically based, they didn't matter. Your position makes us feel bad. So there you go, post, post-truth society. So, it, but like the way the Lord says it, you know, everyone who does wrong hates the light, hates the light. Jesus, who's the way, the truth, and the life, the truth, hates the truth. We don't want to know the truth and avoids it for fear his actions should be exposed. But the man who lives by the truth comes out into the light, so that it may be plainly seen that what he does is done in God. So for ourselves as well, like maybe any of us, or any of you who had a, <clears throat> a past where you weren't working with the Lord, you'll remember in, in those times, like there were certain people you didn't want to see, maybe your mom, or maybe someone in, in your family who practiced the faith, and you actually you didn't want to meet them because meeting them it was like being exposed to the light and just their their purity their holiness their virtue made you feel bad before they opened their mouths just being in their presence you <laughs> they haven't like I, I would often find as a priest the collar does the same thing I don't have to open my mouth sometimes being people just simply being in the presence of a priest it can actually make them feel bad it make them feel guilty I didn't say a thing. And they've never heard me preach. Just to, to see the color, and they, they feel bad about something they've done. I hopefully, yeah. If I represent the priesthood well, you know. Uh, and so this is they hate the light, for fear that their actions should be exposed. So we we have a lot to do um, as as Catholics in today's world. We have a lot to do. We witness to the Lord with our our passion. Our knowledge is important. But our passion is even more important because no matter how much you study, there's all, there'll always be more to know and there'll, there'll always be things that you forget or there'll always be things you don't know. But if we speak passionately about the Lord, passionately, with compassion, with compassion, with compassion, and with a sense of urgency, now, today is important, then we can begin to, to, to bring the light into the world, but not a light that blinds you, a light that warms you. A light that actually consoles you. A light that, that guides you. A light that allows you to, to little by little see the truth of who you are, but also the truth that the Lord is not doing this to condemn you. He's doing this 
to heal you. For God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. That's his goal. That's what he wants to do. That's what he wants to do now. And so we ask the good Lord Jesus to take away any fear we might have of the light. Any fear we might have of the truth. May he grant us healing. May he grant us a, a renewed love and passion for our faith. A renewed love and passion for prayer. A renewed urgency in the living out of the gospel. Lord, that we might experience you and you who are the way, the truth, and the life. Amen.